of this great loss that our nation has just suffered. Perhaps we should find solace in knowing that we were once blessed with such an amazing soul who touched the lives of so many people all over the world. And as South Africans, we can proudly say he was one of our own. South Africa. My name is Gareth Cliff. And we'd like to also extend our condolences to the Mandela family. All that we are left with now are just memories memories of an extraordinary and epic life that captured the minds and hearts across the entire world. Indeed, there will never be anyone like Tata Madiba. We're now left with a mammoth responsibility to forever keep his memory alive by making a pledge to liberate our people from continuing bondage, whether it's poverty, deprivation, suffering, and gender or other forms of discrimination. That is indeed the greatest honor we can give to this departed hero to actively live his ideals. Some of us were blessed with a glorious opportunity to meet Tata in person. If you were one of those people, we would love to hear about your memorable encounter with the great man. You can tweet us on at SABC3 Madiba, Facebook us on our page SABC3 Madiba, or you can SMS us on 32720 at the cost of one rand per SMS. Well, today, of course, was the memorial service at FNB Stadium, which was attended not only by thousands of people who made their way there either on foot or by bus or by train and are still there, but it's also been an extraordinary day because we've been visited by dignitaries from all over the world. Some incredible uh, people from just about every walk of life, but more especially people who <laughs> rule over and, and reign over and uh, make sure that countries run. They've dropped everything to be here to, to commiserate with us at this uh, very important celebration and commiseration. On this sad day of remembrance, Bastsana Kumalo takes us back to the sacrifices that were made by our great leader by visiting Robben Island with Ahmed Katrada. Who knew on the 18th of July 1918, as the First World War raged, that here in the village of Mvezo, one of history's most potent peacemakers would be born. Somehow his father knew and named him Holi Hlatla, which suggests one who pulls the branch of a tree. The full meaning of that name, however, would only be understood in a place a world away from here. Fellow Rivonia trialist Ahmed Katrada shared the same sentence as Madiba and spent almost two decades here on Robin Island. Tell me about when you first arrived here, what were you faced with? Well, the first thing we had to do on that cold winter's rainy day was to change into prison clothes. All my colleagues, my seniors, my leaders, the regulation said they must have short trousers, no socks, right through the winter. I, being an Indian, 
given long trousers. The policy was meant to belittle black African prisoners as boys who wore shorts and no socks except when there were camera crews on site. Small privileges were afforded but to colored and Indian prisoners. So when it came to food, I got caught a loaf of bread every day, but there were no bread. For 10 years, African prisoners did not get bread. After an eight-month trial, this was their stark reality. The defendants had made a collective decision. It was a political trial. And as leaders, they took the opportunity of the court proceedings to make their organization's political beliefs public. Soon after we arrived here, Madiba, on behalf of the leadership, said, comrades, we are no longer leaders. Our leaders are outside of in Lusaka. We are ordinary prisoners like you people, and we don't want any exemption. Around the upheaval of the 76 uprising and heightened world pressure, the state was forced to invite a press tour to make prison conditions appear less severe than they actually were. You will notice that the group here have got hammers, and this group here has got no hammers. So on one day, they gave us light uh, prison labor jerseys to mend. We did not know what was happening. Once the press were off the island, it was back to hammers. The sustained hard labor on the quarry caused long-term damage to Madiba's eyesight. And yet, in an unexpected way, it opened all their eyes to the opportunities they had in each other's company. Your time at the Lime Quarry was meant to physically and psychologically really break you. Talk me through that time. None of us had done pick and shovel work before. So each day you have blisters and bleeding hands, but it was an advantage. When we had smuggled news, that was the time to go from group to group to tell them. The shared knowledge of highly educated inmates turned the island into an unofficial university. Ahmed converted his imprisonment into a staggering four official degrees. Madiba was steadily shaping the learning, insight and resolve that would make him such a fine leader and doing so from these five square bare meters. This is Madiba's cell. This is where he spent 18 years. In addition to what uh, you see here, what is not here, is a bookcase and a little table and a bench. For 14 years, there were no beds. This was our bed, a size of a mat, a felt mat. There were no flush toilets. So this was the toilet bucket. It had to be, it had to be emptied every morning. What went through your mind to have to live here for 10, 14 years in this particular section? Prison is also a state of mind for political prisoners. Life meant life. The first thing you have to do is to stamp your dignity as human beings. You got to change the environment to make it less intolerable. How do you change an environment like this? You have to accept the fact there is no escaping. But you don't even have a concept of, of time, of what month it is, of how, how did you all manage to, to navigate a sense of reality, a normality about just the world out there. You know, some of the things you've got to accept. Uh -huh. You keep on demanding better conditions. There were improvements. In the three years' time, everybody got the same clothing. This is the triumphant of a human spirit. In 1951, Ahmed had visited Auschwitz concentration camp and had been deeply affected. 13 years later, he entered another kind of hell. The sound of the key as you turned to open the door sent chills down my spine. Uh -huh. What did that do to you? Well, you get used to that. Of course, it's a very important thing. You, you raise this point. 
the key is, is a very important thing. I mean, that's taken away your freedom and separated you from your near and dear ones, separated you from the outside world. That's key. 2011 marked the 20th anniversary of the Keys opening for the last political prisoners on Robin Island. For a country which today boasts such a humane, fair and noble constitution, this concrete and iron monument is a poignant reminder. Nelson Hodihlahla Mandela played a pivotal role in unifying citizens of a country that was so depressingly divided. He managed to bring diverse and polarized groups together. For him, we were always Africans first, before we are Amaklosas, Botswanas, Amazulus, Afrikaans, and so on and so forth. We're now joined in the studio by esteemed guests who will give some credibility to what we've just said about Madiba the Unifier. We first got Professor Raymond Sutner. Prof, congratulations on uh, making it here. I'm very pleased you did, despite all the traffic and everything else. Academic, former ANC underground operative, author, past political prisoner. I think you're the right man to ask about what role Madiba played in forming a government of national unity, creating the environment for a multi-party state. I think one must understand that when Mandela initiated negotiations uh, from in prison, many of us were engaged in trying to overthrow the apartheid regime so that uh, it was quite uh, bold of him to start these, uh, in, initiate these talks. And even when he came out, there was a lot of confusion amongst the membership of the ANC. And, and amongst the leadership, there were a lot of debates. There were people who thought he was selling out. Mm. Well, I, amongst the leadership, uh, and I was in many of these debates, we would disagree over directions taken. Mandela was a very determined man. He's a boxer. So that if you engage with him, you could get pummeled. But uh, even though he, would, he may have pummeled you, straight afterwards, nothing would change. The fact, what was quite very important about him, despite being a giant, he would meet you as an equal in debate and be willing to reason with you. And he recognized uh, that the South African Defense Force was not on its knees. And although the apartheid regime could not continue to govern, the Umkonto Sizwe was not capable of a military defeat of that regime. Mm -hmm. So there needed to be talks, and he grasped the opportunity to bring peace. To reduce so bloodshed. It was critical then to unify post-1994 for us to be able to walk forward to where we are today. Yes, but unify, you know we can romanticize these words like unify. There's unification behind common principles which got enshrined in the um, constitution finally adopted in 1996. So I think it's a mistake to romanticize uh, unification. What is important about the imagery of Mandela, when he came out of jail, people were toy-toying. And toy-toy is a military type of dance, shoot, club, all these things. Mm -hmm. Now Mandela would dance, and his way of dancing was an inclusive, affirming way of embracing people. So he was paving the way for building a unified society, but it wasn't easy. Even in the months before the election, there, were a lot of, there was a lot of violence and killings. Mm. And uh, that was the situation that he came into. Yeah, there, was a, there was a huge amount of IFP and, mm. and, and ANC uh, conflict, which obviously he also had to try and resolve. And the IFP came very late to the table. Yes. And there were, there were some unreasonable demands from them and from the old regime equally. Yes, Mandela was very concerned to go into the area and address the people themselves in what's now KwaZulu Natal. And on one occasion. He chose occasion, to vote there. Sorry, he chose no, to vote there. And in fact, he went afterwards to the grave of the first president of the ANC, John Dubin, and said, Mr. Mr. President, I have carried out your mandate. And when Mandela, on one occasion, went down to KwaZulu-Natal, his security advised him that, Mr. President, 
you cannot go there, it is not safe. He said, I'm going. Hmm. They said, Mr. President, we see there's a threat, you cannot go. And he said, I'm going. They secretly phoned Walter Sisulu. And Sisulu phoned him and he said, do you want me to come down there? You are not going. And he <laughs> turned to his guards and he said, so you reported me. And he didn't, <laughs> didn't go. See, Mandela was very determined, mm. but he was also willing to listen to the sage advice of people like Walter Sisulu and Oliver Tumbo. But he did make all these symbolic mm. gestures. Uh, there, yes. there, was, there was a lot of that that you could say was, was, a, was a platitude, that he was really just trying to, to, to create the impression that, that there was this inclusiveness. But it was very real for him. He didn't just, he backed up the symbolism with action. And he was tough too. I mean, yes. in the, U, <laughs> the United Democratic Movement, was brought to heel very quickly once the ANC had reasserted itself. Is that not right? You were a member. No, I don't think the United Democratic Front was brought to heel, but let me take your broader question. Um, what I think, uh, when you, you said, when Mandela spoke about unity, peace and inclusiveness, none of his gestures were the theatrical poses. Mm. He actually, ha Mandela, is ve was very careful about his imagery, about how he dressed, how he appeared from the 50s, mm. uh, so that the boxer realized and the soldier realized this was a time for talking, a time to build the peace. Wow, thank you. Thank you so much, Prof, for visiting us and giving us that very unique perspective from your background. Thank you. Thank you. We need to take a short break. When we return, we will read your tweets, SMSs and Facebook comments.